there. This is Artist Meets Hacker, How Technology is Changing the Arts. Thanks for coming today. Uh, so my name is Devin Smith. I work for a digital agency in Washington, D.C. called Three Spot. But for the last 10 years or so, I've also been working with arts organizations on how technology is shaping how they do what they do, what they put on stage, what they put in their museums, uh, and how they connect with their audiences. There we go. Um, so last year, the National Endowment for the Arts asked me to find some bright spots and blank spots in the arts field for how they're using technology. So basically, what were the artists and arts organizations that the NEA wasn't funding, who should be, because of their use of technology, and where would the arts field really struggling with technology? So it offered me this really great opportunity to go out and talk with a bunch of artists, a bunch of arts organizations, do a lot of research, and this presentation is sort of a, a summary of much of that work that I've carried on for the past year or so. So after looking at probably hundreds of different examples, I took away these four big concepts, some obvious, others less so. The number of arts organizations and their capacity is growing much faster than the number of audiences, especially for in-person uh, experiences. In many cases, those audiences are shrinking. So one way that the arts field is gonna be able to stay viable is through digital distribution, taking real life performances, in-person performances, and being able to stream them or otherwise distribute them uh, online. And the, the arts field as a whole needs to learn how to do that better and more authentically. Uh, the real experimentation going on right now, I think, of how artists are using technology is through solo artists, many of them installation artists, who are probably a little bit outside of the traditional arts field. Even so, in those cases, technology is still a little bit of a novelty. You know, we're really only 10 years or so in to this, um, to this phase of really incorporating technology as a piece of art. And I don't think it's clear that it's um, a movement yet. I think we'll, we'll have to wait another 10 years to really know if it's gonna change the art form itself, uh, or if it's really just another means of marketing and, and connecting with audiences. Professional administrators, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, technology has also democratized the means of distribution and creation. So, you know, almost anyone can, uh, you know, distribute their art, can make their art, and put it out online, reach millions of people. You don't need a big building. You don't need, you know, tons of resources or staffing. Um, as we've seen in so many other fields, this access to the more amateur artists has really increased competition for traditional art organizations as well. And finally, professional administrators uh, aren't equipped to effectively use technology. They're not learning about technology in MFA programs or on the job or at arts conferences. A, a few of them come uh, to places like South By, but um, there are so many more opportunities for learning and for sharing across arts organizations and even across the technology field. And I hope that's really what this presentation is today, is an opportunity to help match arts organizations, artists, people in the art world with technology people. And I'm hoping it's a mix of kind of both in the room today. So as part of that, I'm gonna walk through a bunch of uh, examples of art organizations and artists who are using technology in really interesting ways. Um, in all those cases, I've included their Twitter handle. I encourage you to reach out to them directly if you wanna be involved with them. You know, Figure out how you can be a part of their project and their process. Um, I think it would be great to be able to be a kind of uh, matchmaker during this session. So I'm gonna talk about seven areas where technology is fundamentally shifting the art world. Most of these examples have launched in the past year or so, so there's not a lot of results to report yet. I'm more just giving you a kind of broad overview um, of what's going on. And um, I'm gonna bounce around between artists and arts organizations from you know, marketing to making, so uh, keep up. So first I wanna talk about how social media is changing how we make and interpret art, how we empower audiences, how we distribute content, and who we consider partners. This is an example from the Copenhagen Institute for Interactive Design. Uh, basically, you walk up to one of these um, installations uh, and give it a message that you want, and it will flash in Morse code across the harbor to another installation that's on the other side, receives that Morse code, and then translates that into a tweet. So anybody from around the world can be there in person and actually give uh, each kind of side of the message um, their, their message to send, or you can actually tweet at either of these um, ends and they'll uh, you know, flash signals back and forth from each other. Social, social media in this way is a means of artistic expression. It's using Twitter and other um, online messaging uh, as the actual art form itself. Social media becomes the art form. <coughs> Tribeca Film Festival, uh, this is the second year they have their uh, Vine six second film festival as a real appeal to amateurs. 
So the constraints of social media as, uh, as a medium have enabled this incredible artistic production. So you see people doing animation and other really interesting forms of art, even though they don't have access to a big studio, to a big you know, uh, film budget. Uh, in this case, you know, the shorter medium um, equaled a really cheaper means of production for, uh, for artists. This is from SFMOMA, so they are redoing their building at the same time they decide to redo their website. And the time they decide to take down the website entirely and move everything onto Tumblr. Um, you, we saw this a lot with other, um, you know, when the hurricane came through with New York and all the kind of buildings got flooded, a ton of media organizations moved their entire websites onto Tumblr as well. This was happening about the same time. Um, and it just goes to show that you don't, you know, you don't need to build an entire website to be able to have this really strong online platform. You can use means like Tumblr to get a, a new website set up really quickly. Um, and I think commercial films are probably a really good example of that, or, or independent films even, that many of them now don't have websites at all. They just rely on social media to talk about who they are um, as a film and really promote, uh, promote themselves. By and large, I think most traditional arts organizations are struggling with how to use social media. When they've had this institutional voice that is pretty staid, pretty organizational, doesn't have uh, much personality often, even though the art inside is really powerful and provocative, but the LA Contemporary Museum of Art has been doing a really great job on Snapchat. They were one of the first museums who started using Snapchat in this really playful way. Um, follow along with them and you'll see this voice and this tone that is unlike almost any museum um, that you can imagine. Uh, this is from Twitter UK. So they've done a couple of these events now where they try to match up um, all of the arts or, or many of the arts organizations in the UK, help them connect with their audiences. So this was a Love Theatre Day that happened last November where Twitter UK was promoting arts organizations on Twitter and said, you know, if you want to interact with arts organizations, here's this series of events that we're sponsoring, that we're promoting over the course of an entire day. So in that day, 400,000 people use the Love Theatre hashtag. It was a really um, powerful movement. They've done this with Museum Week uh, in the UK as well. Um, Twitter uh, in the UK has been really supportive of arts and cultural organizations. Um, Twitter in the US, less so. Uh, this is Foursquare. So I've been a Foursquare user for a long time. Foursquare knows that I go to arts organizations. I don't go shopping. So on Black Friday, they sent me this as an email message. They said, why don't you skip shopping Go visit an arts organization today. We know who you are. We know what you like. Um, that was really powerful, that recommendation coming from a third party source like Foursquare. But in order to make that effective for arts organizations to really be promoted, they need to structure their data. Almost no arts organizations website are you know, releasing kind of structured data about their events. It's very um, one off promotion. But Foursquare and other technology platforms can be a really great resource for those arts organizations. So I'm going to talk about multimedia and specifically how we're layering multimedia onto a traditional in-person arts experience. So multimedia really allows you to go from you know right here, right now experience to anytime, anywhere. This is a podcast play from the Forum Theater in DC. Basically, you listen to the podcast and experience the play as you walk around the DC area. So your um, your experience of the play is enhanced by being in the location where those actors at one time were as they were filming that podcast or recording that podcast. Um, you know, theater is no longer bound to this collective gathering space where we all sit in a theater, all watch the stage. You can actually be doing other things while you're uh, listening to this particular piece of theater. Um, you know, podcasting has been the kind of ultimate multitasking media and has seen a real rise in the past couple of years. I think there's a great opportunity for how arts organizations could use podcasting as an artistic medium as well. This is from the Marshmallow Laser Fest, uh, Laser Feast, sorry. They're doing um, a bunch of really interesting work with drones. So I've seen drones being used recently in circuses, in orchestras, a couple of different places are, um, are using them to, to move around lights or costumes um, in ways that have never really been possible before when there was always just fixed pulley systems above a stage. Now drones can fly anywhere. They're, uh, cheap and so mobile, but uh, Marshmallow Laser Feast is actually filming um, filming the experience with drones in real time, allowing audiences to interact with those drones and with the uh, with the film itself. So this is a project that's still kind of in prototype, and they're still experimenting with what exactly to um, to do with those drones and how to incorporate the drones into the artistic experience um, as a as a filming device. This is uh, from Sing London. They have a talking statues exhibit. 
So basically, as you walk around the city um, and you, you see almost any of the public statues, you can swipe your phone over a code near the statue, and the statue will actually call you on your mobile device. So it knows your phone number, it knows um, you know, kind of who you are, a little bit about who you are. And so that particular statue will call you kind of in, uh, in character, and it's a, a narrative recording that tells you a little bit more historical interpretation about who that person was in their life. It, it's really enlisting a very pedestrian piece of technology um, for this really interesting uh, interactive experience. We don't have to always build you know, fancy apps or do um, invest a lot in drones or other technology. Sometimes it's as simple as a phone call and some NFC uh, technology. This is a mobile app from the Philadelphia Orchestra called Live Note. Um, so if you've ever been to the orchestra, uh, you might know that it's kind of hard to sit through for an hour or two hours of just watching people not move around much on stage, just listening. Um, the kind of generation of people growing up right now isn't always used to being able to sit still for that long and pay attention to just an oral experience that has no visual stimuli. So the Philadelphia Orchestra built this app that you can actually engage with um, on your phone while the orchestra plays, tells you what song is playing, it uses a kind of Shazam-like technology to sync up with what the orchestra is playing in real time and give you background notes about you know, who these characters are, what was going on um, in that particular um, piece of music as it was being written. Uh, this is a great opportunity to engage audiences who might not otherwise be engaged if you just gave them a kind of standard experience. This is from Carnegie Hall. They started live streaming concerts and other Q&As with artists um, after those concerts. So this is an example of a master class where anyone from around the world can work with this uh, opera artist and actually learn from her about how she's singing, what she's doing. Um, and it's uh, interesting that, you know, we used to have to go to, to an arts organization in person to experience that. And even then, we'd almost never be able to actually interact with that artist. But streaming technology allows anyone from anywhere in the world to be able to interact with those artists no matter where they are. Um, so that old joke about how do you get to Carnegie Hall uh, might be changing. No longer just practice, it's also a live stream. Uh, this is the Globe Theater Player from Shakespeare's Globe. Um, they've taken basically an, a Netflix-like approach to all of their productions. So they've been around for something like 100 years um, and they have all these performances uh, that they've recorded and more recently, they've started doing more professional recordings of those productions. So if you go to the Globe TV website, you can either rent or purchase um, several dozen different performances that they've recorded for somewhere between four and eight pounds. Um, so in this way, live performance can be preserved and it can be a new revenue stream for arts organizations. Another great example of this is On the Boards TV in Seattle does this, but across lots of different arts organizations, um, not just a singular one, and they've been doing it for five or six years now and have a great uh, case study about it on their website. So I've mentioned some mobile devices uh, here and there, but, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into how mobile devices are allowing us to mediate the artistic experience before, during, and after the performance. So the first is uh, an app called Ego that was actually built by one of my former Spot colleagues for a particular theatrical production. So audiences would show up to uh, the theater performance download this app, connect their social media profiles, and the performance itself actually changes based on who's in the audience. You know, it can steal names of your friends and use them as characters in the play. Different plot points would change based on how many single people were in the audience versus how many married people were in the audience. Um, you could actually interact with, audience, with the actors on stage using your mobile phone. So you could tweet to them in character, and they would actually respond to some of those tweets. So it was really incorporating social media pretty deeply into the theatrical experience. I don't think that's necessarily gonna take off into every theatrical experience, but I do think it shows how we can um, adapt the, the, not just the performance, but the experience of attending art based on who's in the audience. So imagine being able to put people in exactly the right seat or match, you know, find friends who might be in a really large venue who didn't know that they were um, both attending a concert and put them in seats right next to each other. The opportunity to get to know who our audiences is who our audiences are through their social media data. This is an app from Miranda July that came out uh, last year, and it's actually getting rebuilt right now, but it's called Somebody. Basically, you download the app with a few of your friends, and it gives you lines to say and tasks to do. So the app itself turns into a playwright of sorts. It says, you know, it, it identifies you as a character, your friend is another character, 
that says, you say this line to that person, you go do this thing to this other person, and it creates a theatrical experience with the amateurs who actually download that particular app. Um, it really takes participatory art to an extreme. There's no way to recreate this experience as an artist if you aren't deeply understanding what technology is possible. I think this shows one of the reasons why more artists need access to, um, to this kind of technology and uh, to learn about what, what is possible with technology. This is another really interesting app called Karen uh, by Blast Theory. And they basically built a kind of artificial and artificially intelligent um, app that has a, a narrator of sorts. So think Scarlett Johansson's character in the movie Her, only as a piece of theater. So you download the app, the app starts to get to know you, and it interacts with you. It, it's a sort of voice in your ear. Um, the entire thing takes place between just you and this character that, that is uh, embedded in the mobile device itself. Um, it's really interesting. So as, as technology becomes a playwright, does that put artists out of work or not? Is that possible? This is uh, called The Cycle of Futility. It's uh, an augmented reality public mural I actually ran across in Shoreditch, London just a few months ago. Walking on the street, came across this. Um, and as you hold uh, an, an AR app up to it, the, the mural itself actually animates. Um, so little guys kind of run in a circle, things move all around. There was a great example of this at last year's South By called Republic. And that was a big mural that was out there as well, if you saw that. Um, so the ability to um, create these augmented experiences, screens that we have in our pocket, uh, allow us to, to make these static works of art into something that is more um, you know, movement focused. And what happens when we're not just having these devices in our pocket, but if people are wearing Google Glass or other technology that actually allows anything um, that's around there, any piece of art uh, that is public to actually animate itself. This is uh, a new app from the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Um, they've been working on this for about two years. It's called the Skin and Bones app. It allows you to hold up um, an iPad app up uh, against any of 13 different objects in the, in the museum and get this uh, experience from it. So there's another great one where um, there's a kind of spider, uh, spider bones that's being projected behind a glass wall. You put the app up and you reach your hand out and the spider like crawls up your arm. It's a really engaging experience. Instead of just looking at objects and, and artifacts behind a piece of glass, you can actually interact with the art itself. Um, and they, they say it's been uh, the largest collection of 3D modeling in any iPhone app uh, to date. So it's really exciting technology that's just been released in the past month or so. This is an app called Artery, Art Ori uh, that's been produced uh, in Plymouth, England. A bunch of arts organizations got together and said, we have no idea who our audiences are. So many of us, um, you know, we have free or we have cheap uh, means of getting in. So we don't know enough about our audiences. We want to understand Who's that person that goes to every museum in the city once a month or once a year? Who's that person who has only been to one of our arts organizations and not, not to anything else uh, in the city? And so they work together to build this um, app where you can, it's kind of like a digital loyalty card. You check into different arts organizations as you're there, it collects all the data and then gives that data back to the museums and other cultural organizations who then know more about how, um, how audiences are interacting across different cultural organizations. So this real-time use of data allows arts organizations to better market and engage their visitors. I'm going to talk now about learning models. So I, I mentioned that I thought it was really important for more uh, arts administrators, more artists to really understand more about technology and get exposure to technology. So these are a couple of the ways that uh, that, that is already happening. 2AMT is a Twitter chat that's been around for about five years now, just celebrated its five-year anniversary. Um, and it's a couple thousand strong that are pretty active. They're talking about theater. They say it's those ideas that happen at two, two o'clock in the morning. That's what it's named after. And the single Twitter chat that was really uh, happened, I think two guys were kind of talking to each other on Twitter, decided to start this hashtag. Uh, over the course of these five years, it spawned a blog, a couple different festivals, collaborations between arts organizations. It's allowed professionals from across the country to really break down silos that have been around. So people from across different arts disciplines are able to talk to each other on this Twitter hashtag. And I think arts conferences have really started to question what they're around for. When I can speak with my artistic colleagues, my professional colleagues, year round, 24 seven, what's the value of a conference? 
uh, where it used to be just the one place where I came for learning and networking. Now I can do that on Twitter, and there's lots of these kind of specific hashtag chats out there for various arts discipline, uh, from the museum world to arts education. Another way to provide uh, kind of temporary exposure to technologies through culture hacks. So these are where uh, an organization will bring a bunch of arts organizations together with a bunch of technologists, throw everybody in the room together, and just like any other hackathon, try to figure something out, try to create something in the course of 24 hours or, or over the course of a weekend. So there's an organization uh, based out of Scotland who's been doing this and who has a great toolkit of how to make that run, how to find sponsors, how to bring the arts organizations together, what arts organizations need to do to prepare for a culture hack like this, what to share with technologists. Um, so if you're interested in running uh, kind of culture hack-like uh, events, they're a great resource. Um, so another opportunity is for arts incubators. I think these have been on the rise for the past five years or so. There, I've gotten lots of kind of inbound um, you know, people emailing me about, oh, I'm, I really want to start an arts incubator. Where are the best arts incubators? People are really excited about how can I go someplace for just a few months, get access to mentors, access to funding, um, and really the kind of pressure to produce over the course of a few months. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot that kind of meet all three of those criteria. Um, so both the, the pressure to produce at the end, the access to mentors, and access to funding. Um, most arts incubators are missing at least one piece of that puzzle, and I think that's something that really needs to be solved um, in the future. Uh, this was a great Geeks in Residence program that was around, that unfortunately it no longer is, but it's from a company called Sync, uh, also based out of Scotland, I believe, and they basically funded a technologist to be in residence at an arts organization for six months and to blog about what they build, what they teach that arts organization, um, and they have kind of free reign to do whatever they want. They can host a bunch of hackathons with that particular arts organization. They can build things for the stage, build things for the museum, do anything that allows um, the technologists to be there in residence and actually give them that funding and kind of kickstart that learning process for that arts organization. And the hope is that at the end of that six months, that arts organization now can either get funding for themselves uh, or they've learned enough to carry it on on their own. This is from the Google Cultural Institute. Uh, so GCI has been working with um, kind of three different major areas of how they coordinate with arts organizations. One is to have um, uh, digitization of exhibits. So this is what you see here, all those kind of white lines along the bottom are different pieces of the exhibit. You can actually scroll through um, and see uh, artifacts from an exhibit. Uh, and this is for museums, for theatrical performances. Um, most theater productions, after they're wrapped up, you'll never see anything from them again. You know, people might have taken some photos from costume, from the costumes or maybe some photos of the set design, but even that really gets scrubbed off of most uh, theater organizations' websites at the end of that season. So GCI allows those performances to live on through the ages. So that's one piece of it. The second piece is actually using uh, street view technology to go inside a museum. So you've probably seen this where they're actually putting those little kind of robotic cameras into museums and being able to show um, what it's actually like to be in some of these world-class museums. And the third piece is uh, relatively newer. It's a white label app for museums to use uh, to be a, a kind of um, tour. So as you, instead of every museum in the world having to build essentially the same technology to offer uh, a tour through an app uh, on an iPhone, Google has made this possible as just a white label using their, uh, their framework and their structure. But I've heard a lot from some arts organizations that they're concerned that this gives Google kind of all the power, all the data that normally they would, uh, they would be investing, they would be recapping themselves. This is really interesting. So it's from, uh, it's called Hack the Net. Uh, a bunch of people decided that most museum tours are really boring and they decided to create their own. So it's uh, museum tours by young people for young people. They're short, they're interactive, they're small groups, you see you know, six to eight people. And they have people giving the tour who are really passionate about one particular thing, one particular theme in the museum. They know a lot, but they're by no means trained in any sort of artistic discipline. They're just really big fans of the museum. So they started giving these tours at the Met, um, and the Met heard about it and was a little nervous and then got kind of excited when they saw um, how, uh, how excited these young professionals were because they were so bored with kind of all the, the traditional tours. Um, but audiences are now competing with you know, museums and, a, and other arts organizations with some of those revenue streams because half the Met costs money. It's like 20, 25 bucks for a tour. That's money that the museum isn't getting, but it's going directly to the audience. So 
cultural organizations around and competition with their audience as well. I'm going to talk a bit about co-creation and how the audience has become uh, the maker, a curator, free labor at times for cultural organizations. This is really the role and the responsibility of the audience. This is the Tate Modern drawing bar. So basically at the end um, of a kind of series of exhibits, you can go to this drawing bar and draw um, on the screen and then it's projected up onto these kind of hallowed walls of the Tate Museum. So whatever artwork that you draw then goes up on the museum's wall. Um, it gives audiences the agency into the creative process that they've never had before. It's unlikely that any of us in this room would ever have a piece of artwork up on the Tate's walls, but in this place, you can. The Tate has also started, um, or has recently uh, worked with um, an exhibit to, uh, sorry, I'm distracted there, uh, to do Minecraft map makers. So they have a new exhibit, um, it's called Cities, and they decided to recreate the exhibit in Minecraft and hired a bunch of Minecraft artists to kind of recreate these cities that were part of the exhibit. And after they, after they um, kind of launched this exhibit, then they asked audiences to build new pieces of the city, new neighborhoods onto the city. So I think if, if anyone's ever run a kind of user-generated campaign, you know that you get lots of really terrible stuff and just a few hidden gems. Um, I think UGC contests, a lot of arts organizations are um, trying to do more and more, but often you need to model the behavior that you're looking for. So if you can give people some place to start with, some um, example of what you're looking for, and then they can add on to the process themselves. When the audience is part of the creation process, uh, don't just expect uh, nonlinear storytelling or diversions from the storyline. Um, actually create these nonlinear opportunities. So this is uh, a film called I'd Hide You that was at the Sheffield uh, Documentary Film Festival in England, um, and basically they had uh, artists, actors, who had cameras on them um, roaming all over the city. And you could actually follow the artists themselves, um, you know, one particular artist, and see who else they interacted with, or you could follow along online, because each of the actors had uh, cameras uh, kind of attached to their, their headset, as you can see there. And so in that way, people who were actually interacting online were able to send messages to the actors because it was sort of part video game where you were trying to find some people, hide from other people. So it became kind of part live action video game, part theatrical experience, and then part filmed narrative because they were able to actually piece all those different um, films together that actors had taken that were from their own point of view into a cohesive film at the end of the project. This is from the Henry Ford Museum that allows you to build an exhibit yourself. So um, most museums can only show a couple percentage points of the number of actual artifacts that they have. So if they have you know, 100 million different artifacts um, in their walls, they might be only showing a couple thousand at any given time. Uh, the Henry Ford Museum allows you to go into any uh, artifact or um, artifact that the museum has and build your own exhibit in this kind of um, interactive experience online. So in this way, the audience becomes the curator. It also allows teachers, in particular, to build their own collection of exhibits. And in this way, they've been able to work with educators who, instead of just going to a museum and having to kind of force their educational curriculum onto whatever the museum happens to be showing, instead they can go from the opposite uh, end of the spectrum and say, you know, this is what I want to teach my class. This is how I'm going to build museum exhibit uh, to teach that class. This is from the Imp Imperial War Museum. Um, they're basically trying to crowdsource uh, genealogy of people who were in World War II. So uh, audiences, after they've been through this World War II exhibit, can actually stop in at the station and try to identify photographs of people that they might have family members in, um, and starting to build this kind of tree and, and identify uh, people who were influential in World War II, who we might not know about, but they were only preserved through photographs or other artifacts. So this is uh, an undertaking that the museum itself, its research staff, its curators, would never be able to do. It's only through the ability of crowdsourcing that we're able to, to have a kind of fully fleshed out exhibit. Uh, this was a Wikiturgy uh, edit-a-thon for Wikipedia. So one of the kind of bigger problems in the theater world on uh, Wikipedia is the lack of diverse voices. So you see a lot of old white guy uh, playwrights who are on Wikipedia and not much else. So this was a really concerted effort for a day to bring theater artists from all over the world onto Wikipedia and create new, um, new pages, new entries, edit old entries, 
um, about more diverse audiences. Um, and this, uh, this ability to kind of show an un underrepresented group is enabled through crowdsourcing. Data is changing uh, who has access to it, what they do, when it becomes art, uh, and it's actually given rise to data scientists, another analyst, being embedded in arts organizations uh, just over the past few years. So this is from the Dallas Museum of Art. They're at really the forefront of collecting data about their users. So a few years ago, um, the, the amount of money that members paid to go visit the museum was only about 5% of the museum's budget. They were getting most of their money from other sources. They decided the value of data about those, uh, about those members was worth way more than just 5% of their budget. So they made everything free. They asked people to um, download this app or uh, interact with kiosks that were stationed all around the museum and tell the museum, what did you, did, what did you just see? Uh, what are you interested in? Did you like it? What was your interpretation of it? What are you gonna go see next? What do you wish was there that isn't there? Sort of asks you all these prompts um, and then tracks people on their uh, path through the museum about which, uh, which path they take through the museum, if they're there with other people, if they're there alone, how they're feeling about it. Uh, 100,000 people have downloaded the app or engaged with the Dallas Museum of Arts Friends program in the past two years, and they've recouped so much more money than that 5% by being able to share this data with donors to say we're actually much more representative of our community than we ever thought. We have people coming from you know, the entire Dallas metro area, um, and the value of that data of being able to demonstrate their impact to their community was worth way more than the amount of uh, membership dollars that they were collecting previously. This is the Smithsonian uh, public dashboard, so it gives you real-time stats about a ton about the Smithsonian, so individual museums, um, what's in their collection, how their um, websites and social media properties are doing. Um, this kind of public accountability or transparency into arts organizations I think is really important. The more that they're relying on government funding or individual funding, uh, the more they need to be transparent about who's going to the museum, to whose benefit um, are these cultural organizations who are nonprofits or, or tax exempt organizations. So making that data available to the public I think is really critical beyond just 990s, which aren't a very good representative um, sample of what, uh, what data arts organizations have access to. This is the New Play Exchange launched in DC pretty recently, um, and it uh, is hoping to take what was a pretty black box experience of how artistic directors, how theaters found new plays I'm gonna actually bring it out into the open. So any artist can uh, list their new play on the New Play Exchange, talk a little bit about um, what that play is, the characters, kind of who's in it, what they're hoping for, and then any theater in the country can go to the exchange and look for uh, uh, artists that they're interested in working with. Before, these were one-off conversations. This artistic director happens to know that playwright. Um, you know, this, uh, this literary manager happened to go to a festival with a bunch of plays, saw somebody they liked. This is finally taking it into the digital world. So we've seen these kind of matchmaking platforms happen in under other industries a decade ago. The arts are just now really catching up to how to match um, very different people uh, from all over the world onto a single platform. This is the open culture data. It collects uh, a bunch of different data sets from Dutch arts organizations and puts them all in one place, uh, scrubs all the data, standard standardizes it, and then releases it as an API openly to anybody who wants to use it. So if you're interested in building apps that rely on data from museums or from cultural organizations, this is a great API to play with because it comes from data from a lot of different arts organizations. Um, <laughs> most arts organizations don't have the capability to create their own API. And in this case, the government has funded uh, a kind of third party service to do that on behalf of those arts organizations. And there's a ton of apps that they're um, showcasing on open cultural data um, of people that have already built um, apps on top of uh, these different data sets. Data itself can also be art. So this is uh, the open data playground that happened at the Web We Want Festival just a few months ago. And this is where an artist took a bunch of open data sets and explored them through a kind of online, or I'm sorry, an in-person analog experience. And people could explore the data set by actually walking on top of it, could play with the data set itself as a piece of art in this festival. Um, I think as, we, as we've as we seen visualization and kind of visualizations 
of data have been a really high impact for how we understand data. This takes it even further so we can actually manipulate data uh, physically. This is a Spanish artist named Lucia Trudat. Uh, she embedded lily pad Arduinos into her ballet shoes because she was a solo performing artist and she um, you know, wanted to know what, what it looked like, what it felt like uh, to, uh, to be that, or not to be the dancer, but um, basically the lily pad records her footsteps, records the pressure that she puts on the, the ballet shoes, records her movement across the space. She's never been able to watch herself in that granular detail until she put these Arduinos um, into, her, into her ballet shoes. And so now she built an app where she can actually see the kind of traces on the floor that her footsteps leave and how, how high she's jumping, what she's doing. Um, so it's a great opportunity for artists who have never had access to their own data uh, to really interact with that. Um, they've also been thinking about releasing this as some sort of visual accompaniment for the audiences. So what if you could not only um, watch the dancer but also interact and see um, those kind of metrics about the dancer in the real-time performance. Interact interactive objects. So this is where um, humans are the only ones interacting or acting as artists, as curator, as audience. These are the things that are kind of further out, smart devices, artificial intelligence. Uh, most of these are really still a, a novelty. We haven't seen it take off to a huge degree yet, but I think there's a real opportunity for them. So this is uh, an exhibit called The Golden Age from Lava Lab, who's an arts organization who actually has their own um, panel uh, later on at South by and they've um, they've developed a, a Google Glass app so that you can actually go around to the gallery uh, museum and it's a bunch of historical paintings and you can see the connections between the real people who might be in several different paintings so as you look through the Google Glass you can see more information about who those people were in real life what other paintings they were uh, within the museum and it's all using uh, eye beacon technology and so this ability to not just have to look down at your screen or at your phone in order to see more content at a museum, but to just look directly at the art and have that interpretive layer projected onto the artwork itself. This is the Cooper Hewitt, uh, the new pen. So Cooper, Cooper Hewitt is a design museum that uh, reopened in New York after uh, shutting down for a couple of years. And this pen is really exciting. It's kind of got the whole museum world talking. So basically on the back end of the museum you see there, or on the back end of the pen that you see, um, you can swipe that over almost any object in the museum and it collects that object for you and emails you a link to your collection of objects at the end of your museum experience. Uh, they also have several different screens throughout the museum exhibit where you can kind of download all the objects that you've collected and interact with them in new ways. The other side of the pen, that's the stylus, uh, allows you to interact with the artwork itself. So Cooper Hewitt has um, a collection of wallpaper, for example. And you can actually uh, go into a room and choose a uh, wallpaper using the stylus or draw your own wallpaper and see it projected uh, around you in this, uh, in this museum. Um, the pen and, and much of the, um, the website and, and other work that Cooper Hewitt has been doing is all built off of an API. Um, that's another great uh, resource to look at if you're interested in how museums are using API because they've uh, written a lot about it in the past few months. This is from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, they have this uh, chair from Marie Antoinette's uh, kind of personal collection, and it was broken on one side. They were able to use 3D scanning and 3D printing to actually create, uh, to recreate the, the piece of the chair that was broken, and then uh, you know, paint it with uh, realistic paint um, and make a, make a museum artifact whole again. Uh, museums are also using 3D printing and 3D scanning to allow low vision audiences to tactically manipulate um, artifacts that they never would have been able to touch before because they were fragile. Now, if you're <laughs> blind or you're low vision, you never would have been able to touch a piece of art before to really experience it. Museums are now able to 3D print uh, you know, exact replicas of pieces of art and allow people to interact with it. If you know the uh, 19th century novel called Flatland, it's about uh, a group of 2D objects and a, a kind of land of 2D objects that get visited by a 3D interloper and they're trying to describe what, it, what it's like to, be, to live in a 3D world to people who are only in 2D, who have only ever known what it's like to be uh, a square or polygon. Um, and it's a, a great sort of allegory historically. This uh, theater company called Extant just created a new theatrical performance 
Um, the theater company itself is all low visioned and blind artists. And so they've actually created a piece of haptic technology that you experience the entire theatrical production through. Most audiences have never been blind. And so this theatrical experience, you go into a very dark room, you can't see anything, you're holding an object and your entire experience of the play kind of happens through this object. It, it's supposed to recreate what it would be like to go from a 2D world to a 3D world. Um, it's really interesting use of uh, kind of haptic feedback and that, that sense of touch, um, whereas most theatrical experiences are really just light and sound. Uh, the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year had an entire kind of exhibit and showcase of uh, virtual reality films. This one was Birdly from the Zurich University of the Arts. Uh, and it basically allows you to fly above San Francisco as if you were a bird. So you put on Oculus Rift glasses, you lay down in this kind of contraption, you have this fan uh, blowing air at you, and you could imagine that you were a bird. Uh, this ability to kind of put audiences in the middle of a filming experience it's really exciting. Uh, there's a great um, company in London called Inition uh, that has all these um, different kind of VR and AR experiences like this that they've created. And when I was in London a few months ago, being able to um, put yourself in the middle of that experience of a film is really uh, moving as an audience member. And finally, a uh, robot. So this is an artist in residence at Three Legged Dog in New York um, who is a choreographer um, he's worked with technology uh, a long time, and he actually built a robot to dance with him. So he dances, uh, and he designed the robot so that it dances with him. Um, this ability for uh, robots to become artificially intelligent um, artists is interesting. Uh, the uncanny valley that uh, animation artists deal with, of how you have to look, make something look really real in order to, to audiences to really buy it, I think it's going to be a long time before we have actors who are actually robots, uh, more than this kind of novelty, but I think it, it could happen. Um, and so that's it. It was a ton of examples, and I went really quickly through everything. Um, there's a bunch more for every uh, slide here. There's probably five or six other examples that I've left uh, on my slide here. Um, and so go there. Uh, tell me more examples. <laughs> there's even more of them. Um, tell me examples if you know them. I'm really curious to hear from people uh, what's missing, what you know about, what you're really excited about. Um, I want to keep doing this work. This started a year ago and it's going to continue um, after this as well. It's been a great opportunity for me to learn, uh, but I really want to learn from all of you. So get in touch with me. Um, use the hashtag. I'll be paying attention after the, um, after the session. I think we have about 15 minutes for questions, and just use the, the mic in the middle of the room if you have any questions. Hi, Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? Good, amazing. This is really great. <laughs> um, I, have, I have a question about, um, you've been paying attention to so much technology that's happening in the theater space as well. Yeah. I'm really curious. Um, you know, so much of the audience experience is coming into the theater, sitting down, and turning off your phone so that yeah. you can engage in the moment. I'm just really curious. What do you think will happen? Do you think that you know? Do you think there will be some way that we can engage using our phones in a better way, yeah. especially on a commercial level? Yeah. So I think there's always going to be theatrical performances where that is best to come in, sit down, turn off your phone, focus all of your attention on real <coughs> life people, um, especially if something like Google Glass or other kind of wearable technology takes off. And if you think that 70% of your time is mediated through a piece of glass, you're gonna start wanting those experiences that aren't mediated at all and just interacting with real people. Um, but I do think there's a real opportunity to use mobile apps during the performance itself as well. So um, what that Live Note app from Philadelphia Orchestra, they built it so that um, your phone has to stay on really, really low light levels and not distract the other people around you. Um, the Ego app, they actually had house lights at half, um, half darkness so that your phone wouldn't interrupt the people sitting next to you. And I found myself, um, at those times that I wasn't using my phone, I was never distracted by other people because I couldn't see the light from the phone. I think it's actually the, the light that is more distracting, not people interacting with their phones in any way. So if we can figure out a way to solve that, I think we can actually use phones more effectively in the theater.
people don't have questions, there's also uh, some buttons up here that are for artists who consider themselves hackers or hackers who consider themselves artists. Please feel free to come grab one, come talk to me afterwards, uh, leave feedback in the mobile app, and enjoy the rest of your sci-fi.